We're big believers in this term, delegate and elevate. Business of Architecture, episode 368. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking to Anthony Laney, who is an architect and designer and co-founder and partner of Laney LA, which is an architecture firm based in Los Angeles who are predominantly focused on residential work. Now, Anthony has an incredible design pedigree, graduating top of his class from USC, and I was really blown away by this conversation. Anthony really is a true entrepreneur and And in this conversation, he discusses their marketing strategies and their business approach. He goes into a lot of depth about the core values and beliefs of the firm and why they are so important to everything they do from hiring to growing the business to deciding what kinds of projects they should be taking on. And he also discusses how they have been able to expand in the highly competitive residential marketplace in Los Angeles. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Anthony Laney. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Dot com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Anthony, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? Great. Happy to be here. Excellent. And you are all the way out in Los Angeles. You guys are obviously experiencing some wildfires at the moment and the, uh, the run up to the presidential campaign. All sorts of excitement, exciting things happening over that side of the pond, and uh, and you are the the founder of Lanely of of Lanny rather, um, and quite a, a prestigious practice in LA. You've kind of got quite a prolific portfolio of fantastic work. Uh, I suppose the first question is, how can you, if you could take us back to the the genesis of the business, what what was happening then? How did you how did you start? Well, um, I mean, we're right now we are a six year old practice. So if I rewind six years, my wife, Krista and I were um, working for some great firms here in Los Angeles and we, we loved our jobs. And I feel like from a kind of a, from a creative perspective on a project, we were actually very fulfilled. Um, but we had a series of mentors that tapped us on the shoulder and said, you know, it doesn't look like you're firing on all cylinders. Mm. And that, that has become an important statement for me. Um, and I think what I've learned that that meant at the time was that we deeply care about the firm culture, the premise of the project, the type of projects, the typology, all those things that are traditionally upstream from the level of a project manager. And so uh, with that seed of doubt planted in my mind, we started planning what would it look like for us to be the author, not only of a project, but of a practice, uh, Mm -hmm. of a body of work. And so what it looked like was really uh, my wife and I deciding that uh, we were crazy enough to quit our jobs and open up our laptops in our garage and just basically announce to the world that we're open for business. And so, you know, we make that announcement and very little happens, Um, but we just started looking for gaps in the industry to fill. So our model is we'll try a lot of different things and we'll figure out what's the thing that works and we'll then double down on that and then we'll try a lot of things. And so one of the things that we tried was doing very small projects for a uh, very affluent clientele. Yeah. And so that means, you know, like decks and trellises and barbecues and bathroom renovations um, in the more affluent neighborhoods of Los Angeles. And um, we found that that just, those projects often led to other projects. And so it's been a bumpy and thrilling journey. One of my favorite parts has been the teammates that we can kind of add to the team along the way. But um, I don't consider ourselves to be a, 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 
a uh, prolific or well-recognized firm, but in the beach cities south of the Los Angeles airport, we've certainly made an impact because we focus there on basically trying to find a way to make residential projects in their result very delightful as well mm. as the process very delightful so we're only six years into this journey we're a team of 13 architects and designers i love what i do every year my role changes because we do grow about one teammate every quarter and so i don't know i that's that's the beginning and i'm happy to kind of explore with you in this conversation you know different topics that might be valuable to aspiring architects or folks who might want to start their business or maybe folks who have been doing it a long time and might want to try to kind of learn from others and say like, you know, what are they up to? I, I, I learned so much from audiobooks and podcasts. And so I'm, I'm hoping I can contribute my little piece here today. Absolutely. Well, what, what were some of the, the biggest obstacles that you've, that you've experienced in the last six years and how have you navigated your way around them? You know, I, this is sincere. I think the biggest obstacle um, is I will, I'll say it's like in your gut rather than in your head. So, you know, of, I thought that the biggest obstacles were going to be like financing a business or like finding clients or doing project typologies that are a step above what I was used to doing. But I found that really the biggest hurdle has to do with like being comfortable taking a risk in general. Like um, I, I just, it's that feeling in your stomach of uncertainty that I think, it's my opinion, you have to grow very comfortable with that because that is ultimately the biggest hurdle. And so um, in order to get around that, I found that like surrounding myself with brave people, we actually have a core value called the warrior spirit. And mm -hmm. I find that if I hire architects and designers who have have the attitude of that looks hard, I can't wait to conquer it, as opposed to that looks hard, is there an easier way? Um, that surrounding myself with like people with guts um, has really given me the fortitude to always try things that are challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I know that sounds a little bit like a fluffy answer, but I really think that's the biggest hurdle. How, how do you find those kinds of, or how do you align yourself as, as a business leader? Um, this is always interesting to me is, is how you develop a team that embodies those kinds of qualities. How do you go about and find them? Yes. So it's, um, for us, it is an extremely rigorous and exhausting interview process. So I think of it like a funnel. If I can get more candidates in the top of this funnel, and if I can have denser filters, we're ultimately going to find better teammates. Um, and so like, you know, when, you know, in small business, the, the founders are often, you know, mopping the floors as well as signing the checks, we're doing everything. But I work very, very hard to make sure that most of my time goes to two things hiring better talent and finding better clients. I feel like that's where I am irreplaceable. Mm. What is not on that list is, this does not sound sexy, my clients will not like hearing this, is the design part, right? I have, I've, I trust my team with the design piece and I recognize that that's a bit more unusual based on the other small architecture firms that I've spoken with. So. Your question was, how do we find and build that sort of team? Um, it's just about an extremely rigorous, core value-based interview process. Just like a sales funnel, we have an interview funnel where first it's the video, I'm sorry, first it's the written interview, then it's the screening call, then it's the video interview, then it's the in-person interview, one, two, and three. And we basically have a scorecard that says, this is the requirements for the job and how people need to demonstrate past success on those requirements. And we just look until we find the right people. And so the, the only bummer about that is, is we have to say no to a lot of candidates who are wonderful. But the good news is that when we find that teammate and they're like, they're like aligned with your mission, I just, it feels like you can conquer the world at that point. Amazing. It's interesting. You were saying about how your roles your role in the practice is less to do with the design. Was that something that was a surprise to you or was it something that was very conscious um, through your, you know, through the, through the evolution of the practice? 
Or how did that how did that evolve? And and and, and is your so, wife the same, or is she have a have a right? So we um, we're big believers in this term delegate and elevate. I feel like everyone is born with I'll call it a God given talent, a unique ability, something that they love to do and they're good at. And so on a regular basis, uh, we will audit our investment of time. We track all of our time uh, extremely rigorously. We've done that since the very beginning. And we'll say, what are the things that we love to do and we're good at? What are the things we we're good at, but we don't like doing? <laughs> what are the things that we like to do, but we're not good at? Those are hobbies. And we just, we find teammates that are frankly good at the things that we don't like doing or are not good at. And I love design. I, I, I cannot underline that statement uh, with, with enough emphasis, but I've discovered, and here's the surprising part, that I also like being around design. And I also had a lot of personal experiences. Mm. I think a lot of young architects can relate to this where there's like this, I'll call it the napkin sketch business model where the guy or girl at the top does the sketch and it trickles down. And I remember like just hating that. And I just kind of in this polemical, why can't we do it differently statement have been always interested in this narrative of like, like it doesn't have to be that way, right? Yeah. I can be the curator of good design. I can make sure that anyone who I hire full time is the top notch talent, but I don't need to be holding the pen, right? And so um, I, I think it's motivated by me knowing that I can scale my business if I'm not the bottleneck. It's motivated by me having some negative experiences that I wanted to improve on. And I'll, frankly, it's motivated by the fact that, and this is a more of a humbling statement, I think there's people here that are better at it than me, straight up more talented at schematic design than I am. And so we make a good team. Amazing. It's because it, often this is one of the biggest struggles that many architecture practice leaders face is the relinquishing. And also this, this can, as you said, it, this can be a bottleneck to a business is the, the, the failure to relinquish control or the failure to, um, to build out a teams or wanting to have a, a involvement in every, in, in every kind of piece of the process. How, how, what sort of advice would you give to business owners and leaders about, the mental process that's required to take on this form of leadership as opposed to, you know, wanting to control everything. I mean, it's, it's all about what you're aiming for. What is your desired future? And so for us, I think that growth, meaning bigger teams, bigger projects every year brings so much positive opportunity for everyone in our circle. I also, though, have respect for firms who want to be, quote, small by design. That's yeah. awesome. That's okay. I think there's room for everybody. What, I, what bothers me is when I'll hear a firm leader complain about a lack of growth while refusing to, quote, relinquish control. And I'm thinking, okay, well, you, you, I would recommend you clarify what direction you want to head. There's, there's benefits and liabilities to both models. I'm just, I just think that like, I'll call it self-awareness. I know that that can be an overused statement, but like different employees or different firm owners have different strengths and there's just a thrill to be able to operate mostly within your gifting. And mm. so for me, I, I, what gets me excited is building teams and protecting core values and finding great clients and determining the, the premise of a project. And while I also love design, I, I promise you, I get so much joy out of it being like just around me on all sides and being able to like celebrate where I see it thriving, critique it candidly where I see it not hitting our standard of excellence. And I, I love living in that role. Brilliant. I, 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 you mentioned there about core values and being a steward of the values of the business. And, and you know, that's one of the things that excites you. And when you um, look on your website, you've got some brilliant kind of um, wordage about how you've distilled some of those values. Can you just tell us a little bit about some of the values that you hold dear to your, your heart and to the business? Thank you. Yes. So, um, we have five core values and uh, we use them in that. That's how we review, reward, hire, and fire. And um, that, that method of how to use core values comes from um, a book called Traction uh, by an author, Gino Wickman. And it's, it's, a, it's a great resource. I think it's, it's, 
it's uh, industry agnostic. So it's just about like, um, like how to run a practice according to a certain methodology. And that's the one we subscribe to. So uh, we authored our core values, not at the beginning of our six year journey, but kind of in the middle of our six year journey. Right. And it was my wife and our business director, Mebra. And we basically just said, we, we kind of sat down on a whiteboard and we said, who are the teammates that we just love working with? Like who are our rock stars? We put their names on the wall and we said, what is true of them? And we put down all these different adjectives. And then through a process of meetings with that core group and the bigger team, we started to identify um, what we called like a character and an attribute. So, uh, you know, for example, one of them is the servant's heart um, to embrace the art of service. And so I think, you know, some folks we work with, that's like, it doesn't even need to be mentioned, like it's so deep inside of them. But I must admit, I've worked for other practices who they're not there to embrace the art of service. They're there to create a masterpiece, right? And so while that, that does provide a degree of tension, um, but we're, we're putting a stake in the ground saying we embrace the art of service. And I just need to find people who resonate with bringing a big smile onto the face of our clients, right? I just, I, I want my practice to be that way and I respect practices that are not that way. So <laughs> designer's passion, servant's heart, rookie's advantage, one of my favorites, detective's curiosity and the warrior spirit. Those are our five core values. Everyone has them memorized. We talk about them every 90 days um, and we literally <laughs> review, reward, hire and fire according to those core values. Amazing. I mean, cause this is interesting about how you keep them alive in the practice. Cause it's, it's often an exercise that many businesses will do. They'll, you know, their work with a consultant and perhaps they will do it, do it themselves and they'll, they'll come up with some really enticing values, but values and, and particularly those kind of sorts of generation documents, they can fall by the wayside or they become redundant things. It's, you know, I, I walk around bits of London and I see kind of very miserable looking offices with really inspiring words written on the wall. And you're like, they are really not living, living those values. Um, yeah. So, so for you as, 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 as a leader, um, and you kind of touched upon it a bit, a bit there, how do you, how do you, how do you embody the, the values? How, yeah. How, how are they? Um... You have to mean it. I mean, the number one thing we wrote on the board, we cannot choose aspirational values. So for example, I would, I, I would have loved if one of our core values was world-class design. That's an aspiration. We do not, I just got I'm sorry. We do not yet do world-class design. We're not Apple, right? Yeah. We are a challenger brand. We are not the incumbent brand. Um, so they cannot be aspirational. Second, I need to personally try to be on a growth curve of like always embodying that. And third, I just, I really think that those four words review, reward, hire, and fire. When you do that, when you give promotions based on people demonstrating it, people get the picture. When you fire people, we've had to do it based on being below the bar that gets people's attention. Mm. Um, it's, it's when you sit in an interview and you say, with all due respect, I don't want to see your portfolio yet. That's going to come last. We need to talk about, do you possess what we call the rookie's advantage, right? We need to really understand, are you the sort of person who radically embraces a steep learning curve, right? I don't care if you are 28 years into your career or 28 days, we demand a steep learning curve. Does that intimidate you? Do you thrive on that? It's, we just, it, it's probably extremely redundant, but we are, we are committed to this. Mm. Fantastic. Now, just looking at the, the, the structure of the business, how, how many people are you at the moment? Uh, we are 13, about to be 14. Okay. Um, and in terms of the, the kind of business model and how the, the practices, you know, you've, you've kind of focused on predominantly residential um, services. Has there been, you know, have you looked at any other kind of unconventional modes or income streams for the architecture practice? You know, we, um, we've, we've gained the most traction in ground up custom residential homes in the beach cities of Los Angeles. And I would say that is, um, that's coincidental. That's not 
exactly what we're aiming at. That's, that's the opportunity that blossomed the quickest. And so we are, we've been planting seeds for a long time. They just haven't matured in multifamily homes, in um, resort homes far outside of Los Angeles, and in commercial projects. Um, I wish I had more seeds planted in the cultural architecture. Uh, we don't have, we're kind of very young in that category. Um, but I would, I mean, my, if I'm allowed to dream, my goal is to create LA's next leading architecture studio. And obviously we're decades away from that happening, but in order to accomplish that, I, I'm convinced to attract the best talent in, in architects and clients, we, we got to do more than houses. I have a personal passion for homes. I will always invest my heart and soul into these custom homes and it brings mm. so much joy to my just to my being and, and being involved in it but we're we're investing hard in trying to expand our typology um into creative creative workplace environments and um like just all sorts of projects beyond beyond the residential sphere and in, in terms of your your practice growth and how you've been managing that has there been a, a kind of conscious sit down strategy of how you've gone about, um, you know, winning certain projects, winning certain, you know, dominating or kind of growing in certain markets? How have you been planning and strategizing that? Yeah. So, um, we, um, we're very focused. <laughs> I'm a, I think I'm, um, on the creative spectrum, I'm definitely like the robotic disciplined type individual. I that that's just, I think what, the way that I am. And so, um, you know, we work very hard to define our 10 year plan, our three year plan, our one year plan. Every 90 days we say, okay, what are we going to accomplish in the next 90 days to get us closer to our one year plan? And then we say, okay, what metrics do we track every week to make sure that we're getting to our 90 day plan? And so you, your question was about growth and, and sales. And so, yeah, every week I have goals of how many proposals I need to send and how many clients I need to touch and how many opportunities I need to nurture. Obviously there's a lot more metrics than that, but on the sales side, I have a 10 year target in mind and we just keep breaking that down into what are the activities I can control today that will get, you know, get us closer to where we want to land. And look, I don't always hit my goals, but I feel like at least if I can generate extreme intentionality in a focused direction and get 13 people to focus on the same thing, we're going to have a much better chance of getting there than if we were just to wake up and say, all right, what am I interested in working on today? Mm. Where, where did your passion and love for, for the, the business aspects of, of architecture come from? So uh, it, I would think for me, I think it came from architecture school. So um, in architecture school, they teach you to iterate, right? Not to come up with one idea, but to come up with 10 ideas. They teach you to pursue candid critique, right? To pin your stuff up on the wall in front of your peers and architects and have them basically point out the weakness, right? Yeah. So that, I'm going to just call that process design thinking. How do you think wide and how do you expose yourself to critique? What shocked me was that my classmates would thrive in that environment, but then anything that wasn't project related, they would, they would not like deploy that same sense of bravery or creativity or, or iterative thinking or exposure to mentors and, cr and criticism. And I was like, guys, this design process is so good. Like it works. And so I just, I don't know, I, I feel like it felt for me like a natural connection, like, okay, if we're going to write a resume, if we're going to build a portfolio, if we're mm. going to write a business plan, if we're going to negotiate an insurance policy, let's, let's, let's talk to a lot of people. Let's ask ourselves, how else can we do it? Let's find the best person in the industry and just beg them to spend 15 minutes with us because that's what we do in the design process. And I just found that like, I think I learned that's not a normal way to think. And I thought, well, then I'm going to do it. I'm going to be the person who brings design thinking into all parts of the practice, not just the projects. This is mu this is music to my ears to hear this. And, and it's, it's very much. the name of this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> and, it, it, and it's been one of these conversations that, I mean, I'm very passionate about myself is, is that yes, the design, the design tools that we have, the architectural way of thinking about a building, 
you know, which is basically designing a complex or, um, system or a complex organization yeah. of things. Without seeing the destination. Exactly. This is, this is perfect for designing businesses. There's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be relishing business and bring in the kind of, you know, the, the, the creative fervor that we bring to our design projects, that we can bring this to our, our, our businesses and get stuck in with the, you know, with the, with the, the complexity. And the, again, the iterative process as well, which is so powerful in design, is kind of crucial in evolving a company and evolving a business. We um, call it, we call it what's working, what's not working. And what I like about that phrase is it works in business and in design. So you pin up a design and you say, let's talk about what's working, right? What are we proud of? Now let's invite what's not working about it. Where does it fall short? And mm -hmm. we'll do that with our, with all sorts of elements of our studio. Let, let's, let's um, jump into a bit about marketing and, and sales. Um, how, how or what, what, what do you find are some of your most effective marketing strategies or the way that you win work, for example, in the, in the residential sector where you've kind of started to put, get a real good foothold in? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll make a few comments that are probably less helpful, but just, yeah, because they're so predictable. But like my, my recommendation is to track the referral source. So like with that one piece of data, how did the client hear about you? I would say that's, that's a very powerful piece of data. Now, right. I think the even more powerful piece of data that you can build into that is this. What is the story that this potential client is telling themselves as to why they want to hire you? And I find that a lot of architects um, are not open-minded about the real story that that client is telling themselves about the architect. And every story I think is different, right? For example, it could be, um, speaking as a client, I feel so smart because I found the undiscovered talent that will one day be discovered. That's very different than, um, I have a real estate agent who I trust who said to use this team. That's a very different story. And so my job, um, not to sound overly mercenary or overly strategic or inauthentic, because we believe in what we do. We think we bring a truthful, just heartfelt service to all that we do. That my job is to say, what is the story they're telling themselves? And how do I leverage that story to get them to close the deal? Mm. How, how do you do that? How do you, is it a speculative thing that you do? Like just kind of imagining what the client might be thinking or is it a, a conversational, conversational di di dialogue? It literally starts with like, wow, thanks for calling. May I ask, how did you hear about us? And they'll say, and I'll say, hey, can you just educate me? Like, what are the things that you're afraid of going wrong in this process? Or, oh, like, may I ask, like, what part are you excited about in this? Oh, what did your builder say you should do or not do, right? I'm just learning about, like, like what are their values? And believe me, there are times when I have to say, we, we say it all the time, respectfully, we're not the right team for you, right? What we hear you looking for, we're not the best team for. But when we hear someone who want, who values art, right? They identify with the project. Um, they want to be on the forward side of trend setting rather than on the tail side. When I hear those things, then all I need to do is share my screen and show them our process and they will, they're just going to light up, right? Because I've qualified them as someone who's a good fit for us. Can, can you walk us through a little bit? That was really interesting to hear how you, you know, handle some of the incoming calls. Can you walk us through the process of, of how you, how the business kind of handles an incoming lead and then what happens to it and what your sales structure is and, and to how it then gets closed as a deal. And is it you yeah. that's kind of the one that's doing that or is there a team of you that you, you know, everyone's trained in being able to do it? It used to be, it used to be me. Now we have our office manager, Madison, who's, we call her the director of first impressions. So if you call her office or if you send That's an brilliant. email, she's going to, she's the radical responsiveness is the first thing. So what we did, we basically mapped every step in the sales process. And we said, if we're competing against another architect, um, how can we stand out at every single step? So the first is radical responsiveness. Okay. The second is 
um, we want a human connection right away. So it's going to be like, we get, we get a message on Instagram, like, Hey, we have a project, you know, Madison says, thank you. Can we get on a phone call? Right. Cause she wants to like get that human touch. So we call it high tech, high touch. Um, the next step is on that call, Madison will be extracting the five basic things that any proposal needs. What's the scope? What's the timeline? What's the budget? What's the fee? What's the referral source? But most importantly, what are their values? We want to extract that information. Then rather than giving a proposal, um, I think this is a very clever step. We basically give them a one page proposal summary. We found that um, people, they don't like the big thick contracts. We need them, but they just want to know, are you interested in the project? Like what are the opportunities you see? What's it going to cost and about how long it's going to take? And then we just put a giant disclaimer that this says like, this is based upon one conversation. We could be wrong. Right. And let's, let's get to the final proposal together. Mm. So, you know, that might slam the door in our face because they don't want what we just provided on that one page report, or they might be like, that's interesting. Like, let's, let's work through that together. So then, um, you know, site meetings and, and we bring them into our office and, uh, ultimately, we give them a full proposal, and I really love this website called Loom, L-O-O-M, where oh, yeah. I can narrate all the um, like fine points of the agreement, and they can listen to it or not listen to it, but it just adds a human component to it. And so that's just an overview of our sales process. I mean, like anything, it can be done with elegance or it can be done with clumsiness. And you know, again, we're only six years into this, but we're trying to make it delightful. Mm. Did, did you find with the um, how, that step there talking about the proposal? Because obviously this is something that I have conversations with architects all the time about proposal writing and the frustrations with, you know, how how long it takes to put together detailed proposals and then never hearing back from clients. And I'm I'm always an advocate of of conversational selling um, and kind of closing deals and being able to handle objections face to face where, where possible. How did you develop that proposal system to, to reduce it down to the single page? Was this through trial and error or, or speculating about how best to close it? And did, and did you end it? Were you measuring the metrics to sort of see how effective it was comparatively to the, the previous process? Oh Yeah. We, I mean, we track our time in preparing proposals. Obviously we track the time in investing in a project. So ultimately I can see, like, I want to know, did I make a, two years later, did I make a good decision there? <laughs> um, when I, when I wrote that fee, um, I just, I, I love to draw and, um, I, this is a silly story. I'll try to make it quick. When I travel and I bring out my sketchbook and I draw people, look, people like lean into that. And so, um, early in our process, I remember thinking to myself, what if I wrote the proposal on site in front of them? So I like created this template with like light gray lines where like I could try to like quickly draw a proposal. Um, and I remember just watching them be like, A, I didn't expect him to do this. And B, it's, it's, it's uh, quick, right? It's fast. They, they, they don't need to wait. And so I think that just like started this habit of like, let's just try different ways of doing this and let's just see what people respond well to. Ultimately, I found that like whether people are going to say yes or no, they just, they, they, most people want the macro picture. Some clients want the details, right? And that's going to be a, a misfit for them. But most clients want the big picture. Is it going to take a year or two years? Is it going to cost $100,000 or $500,000? Are you interested? Or are you not? And so I just like to get them that big nugget soon. Um, and then we got, we'll solve a lot of work to do, but I would rather get that in their inbox in an hour while the other architect waits two weeks and delivers this dictionary. Right. I, I just, I'd rather do that. Yeah. How, um, for many architects there, you know, the, the marketing and the selling side of a practice is, is quite frankly, it's frightening. Um, and it's yeah. not something that we, we want to deal with. There's rejection yeah. that's involved. There's the, yeah. you know, the, the kind of reaching out to people that you've never met before. How, how, do, how have you navigated some of that, that kind of fear that people might have over marketing or that's why, or was it always I mean, natural to you? No, no. That's why the number one hurdle is in the gut, not yeah. the head, right? It's, it's, it's that, icky feeling of self-consciousness 
I remember my mentor saying, you need to reach out to 10 people every day to tell them you're open for business. And I just felt, I just, I did not enjoy that process. The, a few things have helped. Um, that, that sense is still there, but a few things have helped. One is that like, um, I've started to think about selling in terms of serving. Mm. And that's really helped me. Like if I can sell well, I'm going to be connecting dots for people in a helpful way, whether or not I get the privilege of serving as their architect. And so just that mindset shift of like, how do I serve them in the sales process motivates me when it comes to marketing. There's this additional layer of self-consciousness of like, is it, is it like, is it prideful or improper or impolite to kind of like bang your chest and say, look at my beautiful work. Um, and so again, I think of it like, okay, to serve my team the best, I need to get the very best clients I can to get the very best clients I can. I need to, ex I need to widen the funnel at the top and I need it to be very clear. What do we stand for? And so I, I, the thing that helps me is to try to take a more didactic approach, like more of an educational approach, like rather than saying like, check out this new project. It's to like, when I caption things on Instagram is to try to identify something that you might not have seen if all you see is the image so that, you know, whether you want to buy us or like a buy a house or like hire us to, to be your architect, you would at least like in your 15 second interaction with our content, you would have left slightly more educated than before. And so those two things serving for selling and like educating for marketing has just helped me go in a, I think a little bit better of a mindset yeah. to like give myself the courage to just be a little louder than I probably would normally be. It when you've been dealing with clients and growing growing the practice, I mean, for typically lots of architecture practices go for this phase of either charging too little at the beginning and slowly in, incrementally increasing their fees. Um, what sort of process have you gone through with setting your fees, and how have you, you know, do you do you still get it wrong sometimes, or is it, you're always hitting it? You hitting it on the mark? How how do you work it out? And how, and how has it changed? It yeah. And how has it changed specifically as, as your marketing and selling systems are becoming more sophisticated? Yeah. So, um, when we launched, we had no data, we were just guessing. Um, and so I, I don't know, I don't know a way around that. We just had to make a promise and keep the promise. Yeah. Um, today we have hundreds of projects that um, are either in the works or completed, and we can track the time and the cost investment of all of those projects uniquely. So every uh, employee has a salary, they have their overhead costs. We break all that down to a very specific, for every hour that teammate A invests in project X, that comes with, a, with an associated cost. And we just compare that to the billing cycle to say, okay, let's just be real, these projects are profitable, these projects break even projects lose money that that's right. just the truth we try to extract lessons learned from that in order to more intelligently scope the projects and so when I give a proposal uh, our office manager Madison she gives me a sheet that our clients don't see which is comparing that project to all of our other projects in terms of complexity, scale, square footage, construction budget, location. Um, and I can, I can just look at it through all these different lenses. All those lenses are basically informing me to charge a certain amount. So based upon, let's say square footage, a project right on the water might be a small project and might appear to deserve a low budget. But compared to this other lens, which is how complex is the entitlement phase, it might deserve a very high fee. And so I'm looking at it against all these different parameters. There's a science, but there's also an art to it. We like to give a fixed fee. I just yeah. think that a consumer benefits from the fixed fee and it also rewards us for sharpening our process. So not all that we do is that way, but our core business model is based upon a fixed fee. The truth is um, we have increased our fees every single year. Um, the truth is our deliverables have, have improved every single year. And my only advice on the top would be to understand your current position in the market. Are you the challenger brand? Are you kind of competing with 
the main brands out there, where do you fall? Because that'll influence the story that the client is telling themselves that is really that exposes the value system as to why they should or why they should not hire you. Fantastic. And in, in terms of uh, business development into new sectors, mm-hmm. and particularly if it's a, it's a cultural building or an area perhaps you haven't done much work in before, how do you, how do you broach that as a team and as a, and as a strategy? Yep. Well, the easy part is to set the intention. We kind of, we write down by this date, our goal is to have this type of work. And so then I break that down into smaller chunks. And so what I'm working on today is a series of joint ventures where I can reach out to other relationships who are more mature in that sector than I am. And I can say, Hey, um, I don't have the experience to break into this sector, but I've got 13 architects who are incredibly talented at ArchiCAD using BIM. I have a very robust design process. I can provide 3D prints for you. We know how to detail highly complex connections. How can we support you? And so we've we've had some lovely interactions. Uh, We just did one in Malibu on a massive golf course where there was museums and hotels. And we got to play the role of designer uh, because this other architect at the time he just, I would say, wasn't technologically savvy enough. So he sketched out an idea on his iPad. We brought it to life, 3D prints, renderings, the whole deal. And suddenly I have something in my portfolio that takes us one step closer to where we want to go. So mm. in a word, it's, it's supporting the experts to get closer to that typology. Fantastic. Fantastic. And in terms, obviously, it would be kind of crazy not to mention this pesky virus that's been going around. How, how has um, the bizarre events of 2020 uh, with COVID, how has that impacted your office and how are you, how obviously I, I get the sense again, you have such a strong sense of values that comes out of it. And a lot of that seems like it's, it's people driven. Um, how, how have you been looking after your, your team whilst, you know, uh, during lockdown and maintaining the, the, the spirit of those values? How have you managed in, in such difficult conditions? When we, when we received the mandatory work from home news, um, we set the intention that we want to emerge from this uh, more connected, uh, more innovative, and in better physical shape. <laughs> so as a team, we set those three um, intentions. And so um, the thing that's helped make it easier, my heart goes out to all the like restaurant owners But for us, all of our systems were already in the cloud and we already tracked all of our time. We already had weekly scorecard KPI metrics for every teammate. So I thank God as a business owner, I didn't have to worry are my people being productive. I literally have a dashboard that we've been using for years. So we just take our laptops home and keep working. And so we were incredibly fortunate on that front. Um, In terms of keeping culture connected, we, you know, we do all sorts of like physical fitness competitions and we started having meetings in big circles on the beach, socially distanced. Um, and, you know, it was a little bit scary to like, we invested in this big office here uh, not too long ago and to have the office feel more empty was a little bit discouraging. But I realized like, you know, my greatest assets, they walk out the door every day. That's always been the case. And so now our studio has become a little bit more of a showroom, a little bit less of a laboratory. And I'm okay with that in the big picture. Um, I'll recommend a, um, a software called Miro, M-I-R-O. That's been a really fun way to do design meetings with where you see 13 cursors moving around. Um, I'm sure everybody knows about Slack and Zoom and all of that. Um, but really, ArchiCAD teamwork has been another game changer for us. We've been using that for years where we can, you know, our structural engineers actually aren't often in California. They're all over the world. So I just... I felt like we were extremely fortunate to be set up with a tech foundation Mm. to make it, to give us one advantage. The second advantage was, um, you know, despite our commitment to creativity, we do run an incredibly disciplined kind of accountability based um, scorecard system. So, you know, my managers, they know what their teams are working on. And, and, you know, I, I feel like, that, that avoids that, that feeling in your stomach of like, oh no, I, I can't see what my team is working on. Are they wasting time? I'm just so thankful. I don't have to think about that. 
Are you able to give us a little glimpse into how you've structured the office in terms of teams, roles, responsibilities, and, and the hierarchy? Yeah, so we, um, I have a leadership team that's me, uh, my business director, and my studio director. Studio director is a licensed architect. And um, my business manager has a team. Uh, she manages the office manager. My studio director manages five project managers. And each of those five project managers manages one to two support staff. So it's, it's I think architects, you know, we tend to be egalitarian uh, and like, you know, kind of we're, we're all in this open office. But I'll admit, we have an extremely structured organizational chart. And so everyone knows exactly who is their supervisor, who they report to. And I just think that adds clarity, especially when you're not sitting directly next to someone. Do do you have very clearly defined roles for each person when they enter? Everybody has has their four uh, areas of responsibility. Everyone has a scorecard that they they report on every single week as to whether those metrics are on track or off track. So yes, I mean, we, I just find um, at first, when someone enters our firm, they're like, oh my goodness, you guys are data freaks. You track everything like you're so robotic, but it eventually becomes second nature. And once you're able to get above the data, then I can all, you know, I'm, I can like, I look at this, this scorecard and I can immediately spot where my attention needs to go. And it's Mm. just, we're able to go farther um, than we would if we had to like, if we didn't have that data. It's it's interesting. I mean, when I talk to architects about um, implementing systems into businesses, um, there can often be a bit of resistance uh, due to the fear of what you know the over over systematizing a creative process. You're gonna yeah. we're, we're gonna lose the heart and soul of what it is that we do. Have you experienced either resistance from for implementation of of systems, and if so, how have you how have you weathered that? Or, or, All right, so or, I'm going to share or, and, a story. And, and how do you maintain the heart as well? Yes, I'm going to share a story, and if it comes out wrong, I might ask you to cut it out. So <laughs> if it we, we, we stick in our lane. Um, we had a, um, a leader on our team who, in my opinion, did not share my conviction that creativity and discipline can go hand in hand. Mm. Uh, I respect him a lot. But I think he saw it more as there's creativity over here and there's kind of discipline and organization over here and their intention. And um, we're, we're no longer co-workers. Um, and I don't see that tension. Um, I do recognize what I'll draw as, a, as like a bell curve where if there's too much structure, it's stifling. If there's too little structure, it's confusing. I think there's an appropriate degree where there's a middle ground of structure that allows for a healthy studio environment that's both clear and free. So we, we try to strike that balance, but I think you're right. I'm reading into your question. I know you speak with, you know, dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of firms and most of them fall way too far on the unstructured uh, uh, spectrum. And so, you know, there's the fear of like, Oh, if I, Am I boxing myself in? Like, I want to be creative. I just, I just think that is a false fear. I think that great discipline can um, buttress great creativity. Um, and so, yeah, I, on one hand, I think it's a false dichotomy. On the other hand, I recognize there is a balance we need to strike. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And it's, it's, a, it's a common topic that, that comes up. And I often say to um, practices, if you look at jazz musicians as an, as an art yeah. form, as a creative, okay, like on the one surface there is free flow, improvised, uh, improvisation, music, but they are the most s- structured, well-rehearsed musicians that you're ever going to come across. And they have you know, little uh, ways of practicing certain, you know, hum- harmonies, certain melodies, mm-hmm. certain structures, scales, like they are some of the most disciplined artists you're going to find. And it's, uh, that is the thing that allows the, the, you know, the freedom in a way to, to kind of, to be creative, creative, creativity does, it, it sits on top of the foundations of structure and discipline. Right. I think that is so true. I could not agree more. That's a, that's a great analogy too. I might borrow that jazz musician. <laughs> Absolutely. Brilliant. So what's, what's, 
what's for rest of 2020 and how are you looking for 2021? Well, um, we are, um, we're working hard to try to expand beyond Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, here in California, there's San Diego to the south, there's um, kind of Malibu and Santa Barbara and San Francisco to the north. So we're working hard to expand our territory. And that means that we're always looking for the most talented architects. And so um, perhaps I could use this little platform to just make that announcement that we're always recruiting. Um, and so what is 2020? Uh, I, I see us having a very strong quarter four with some exciting projects on the horizon in 2021 i do see continued growth and despite the headwinds and all the uncertainty we're just we're just going to keep going for it just because i feel like it's that personal and corporate growth that i think makes the day-to-day -day exciting brilliant and that one one final question obviously you and your your wife work together very closely both <laughs> partners yeah. founders of the of the business how how do, how how have you made that work what 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 are the secrets to to having such a, an intimate relationship and a working relationship and i know lots of architects do it and do it very well um yeah i mean we we kind of don't know any better so krista and i we met in architecture school and so we've just been this i would say creative duo from day one so i we kind of don't know any better um I would say though, on a more practical note, like our roles change every single year. Right. Um, we homeschool our four children and the, the demand on my time and her time and her involvement here and my involvement there, we've just, we've, we've committed to being open about it always evolving. Mm -hmm. And I think it relates to one of our first topics, delegate and elevate. Let's, let's work hard to think what do we love to do and we're very good at and how do we align ourselves with other loved ones and teammates to uh, do what they're good at in a complementary way? And so Krista and I are extremely different. Um, we're also extremely complementary in that. And so that just means, you know, there, we've had to let go of certain roles and onboard new ones as life evolves. Fantastic. Anthony, I think that's the perfect place to conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for giving thank us that, that tour inside your, in, inside the, your business and how you've grown and how your, your marketing and entrepreneurial business mind has really kind of merged beautifully with the creativity of architecture. Thank you so much. It's, it's uh, such a fun talk and I am so glad that our industry has these, um, I don't know, champions of the creativity of business and architecture. And so I just, I, I so admire the platform that you've built and the influence you're making. And so if I can kind of help in any way, please just reach out. Thank you so much. Brilliant. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.